Well, good evening, folks. It's lovely to see you here tonight. And uh, tonight we're having a public seminar by our ladder perch, Ocean Plum. But I have got my housekeeping duties, so I must point out to you, dispatch, that we have our next seminar is the 19th of April, and it's in the Town Hall. And it's the Archaeology and History of the German Trade with the Northern Isles in Iceland during the 16th century. And that's our honorary reader, Dr. Natasha Miller from Vienna. And on Wednesday the 9th of May at 7.30pm in the King Street Halls, we are on tour, clearly. Uh, it's Medieval Orkney, a Scotland or a state. And that's Professor Barbara Crawford, known so well to you all. So I look forward to seeing some of you there. Now I asked Ocean for some notes on what to say about me. <laughs> so I have the facts in front of me here. Well, Ocean's originally from Edinburgh. He studied medieval Celtic studies at the University of Edinburgh, followed by a master's degree in medieval history, also at Edinburgh, and a PhD in Scottish history, also at Edinburgh. Yes. Uh, it's a bit like my own career, it's a high feature of Edinburgh in that too. And his PhD was actually on the migration from Northern Britain to Ireland in the early medieval church. And he won the Macfarlane Scholarship from the Scottish Centre for Diaspora Studies at the University of Edinburgh to do this. He got his PhD in 2016, but of course we knew him before that. It was many years before, not that many, but some years before, uh, Ocean gave us a wonderful paper at um, CNS. And then we were very happy to welcome on the, him on the team um, at INS in June 2017. And uh, Ocean's very musical, plays the whistles and the euphonium. And in fact, plays the euphonium in the Kirtle Town Band. So be sure to look out for them. We'll see them so I'll just hand over to you. Oh. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks very much everyone for coming today, and uh, it's uh, lovely to be here giving another paper here as a member of staff this time. Um, it's I think four years ago I did it, I presented last time, and so yes, quite a lot of changes in that amount of time. And I'm going to be talking today, as I'm sure you know, um, unless you've taken the wrong turning and come into it by accident, talking today about Columba, Nessie and the deadly loathsome little creatures. So, what we're going to do today is have an investigation into the monsters depicted in Adam Nunn's Life of St. Columba, which was written in the 1690s, um, and have, ask what the sources for these tales are, and whether there is any truth behind them. Uh, before we go any further, this is probably my favourite thing that the British Library has ever posted on their blog. It was a few years ago, and it was posted as a definitive proof um, of a... No, previously unrecognised medieval account of the Loch Ness Monster. Now, unfortunately, it was posted by the British Library on the 1st of April. <laughs> uh, so, not sure how much we can read into it, but I thought it was just too good not to, not to have here. Anyway, so, just to start us off, it's probably a good idea to talk about who Columba actually was. So, you have probably heard of St Columba. He's otherwise known as Colin Kill. And he was born between 520 and 22, as far as we can see. His original name wouldn't have been Columba, which means dove. Um, Colin Kill means dove of the church. It, much later tradition gives his birth name as Crimthin, although we don't really know uh, what his actual name was. He was part of quite a powerful family. Um, he was a member of the Kennel Connell, which uh, was one of the most powerful kindreds in the northwest of Ireland. So as far as we can tell, he was probably born somewhere in what today would be Donegal. He left Ireland to found the Monastery of Iona around the age of 40. Now, we don't, again, I know this, this is a constant theme in this summary here, we don't really know why he did. Much later tradition actually attributed it to exile. Um, much, much later accounts said that he had had a fight with another saint over the fact that he had plagiarised his book and uh, the king exiled him. Now, um, our earlier accounts have nothing to do with that there. Um, but all we know, he did leave Ireland. He went to found the monastery at Iona, although he went back to Ireland plenty of times. Um, after that, um, as part of his duties as abbot of Iona. Now, Iona wasn't a standalone monastery. It had, it was the head of a family of monasteries that was even starting to develop, as far as we can tell, in Columbus' time um, itself. The most prominent other house that was kind of underneath Iona was called Hineva, and we don't actually know where that was. Probably somewhere in the Inner Hebrides, but we're not entirely sure. Uh, what we are sure about is that Columba died on the 9th of June. 
five minutes in. So that's Columba, a very potted history. I thought it might be an idea to just put a little bit of a very rough map here, just to give you an idea of the kind of places that we're talking about. So we have Iona here, I'm just being careful not to touch this, because it's sensitive, but Iona there, just off Mull. And that was part of an area of what's now Scotland uh, called Dalryada. And this kingdom spoke a language called Old Irish, which is the language that developed into modern Scottish Gaelic, as well as modern Irish and modern Manx. Um, so that was where Iona was there. As you can see, very close to it, in a lot of directions, you have the Picts, who spoke an entirely different language, as far as we can tell. So they were up in sky. A lot of them were across the Grampian Mountains as well, where the bulk of the kingdom was. We think the most powerful Pictish territory was Fortu, which we think was around about there, across the Great Glen. So um, they were the only peoples in Northern Britain at the time. You have Britons, so people that spoke a language that was ancestral to modern Welsh, down here, in the southwest. And by Columbus time, you're starting to have um, Anglo-Saxon influence down here in the southeast of what's now Scotland, so old English speakers down there. So that gives you just a very rough outline of what's going on and uh, where different people are in Columbus time when he settled on Iona. What evidence do we have for Columba? Well, there are three particularly early sources that we know about. The earliest is called the Avra Columkil, which is attributed to a poet named Dallin Forgill, and was traditionally considered to date from the time immediately after his death. Now, that has been accepted by most scholars, although recently it has been argued by uh, Jacobo Basagni that perhaps its final form as we have the, uh, have the work today, it might date from the 9th century, but built on a 6th or 7th century core text. So it does seem to have a lot of early, early material in it, although it might have taken a bit of time to come to its final form. It's a eulogy uh, for Columbus, so it's a, it's a lengthy poem. It doesn't necessarily give us a lot of detail into his life, and so that, that's not what we're going to be looking at today. Another slightly later work that we know of was a collection of miracles by Kumina the White, which was written in around about 640. Now, um, Kumina the White was uh, another abbot of Iona, who was abbot a few decades after he wrote this work here. Unfortunately, most of it has been lost except one small fragment, but we do know it existed, and we do know that it was a source that Abbotman, who we're going to talk about in a minute, used when he was writing his work. So, the third of these early sources for Columba is the life of St. Columba, which was written by Advenant, who was the ninth abbot of Iona in the 690s. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. So, Advenant, who you'll sometimes see, particularly in Ireland in modern times, referred to as Eunan, um, because modern Irish apparently has managed to knock off like half the consonants in the world, world over, over the course of the past millennium and a half. Um, but uh, Advenant was the ninth abbot of Iona, he was born either 627 or 628. He was also part of the Kerel Connell, like Columba. In fact, he was a relation of Columbus. Uh, he was possibly born in the southwest of what's now Donegal. And he was a monk in Columban Monastery, so that's the monasteries underneath Iona, uh, for many years prior to becoming abbot. We don't really know much more detail than that, but we do know he became abbot of Iona in 679 and he died in 704. Now, Adivnan has been described as the only early medieval Irishman that we can really get to feel something about his character in, really, because we do know quite a bit about him compared to a lot of people in this period. Um, so, here's just a bit of a potted uh, biography here. Um, he was well known in his own time, for writing a work called On the Holy Places, which was a description of various holy sites in Jerusalem, its surrounding area, and Constantinople. Now, um, as well as that, he was responsible for a law called uh, either Coin Atherman, which translates as the Law of Atherman, or Lex Innocentium, the Law of the Innocents, 
which allows a law prohibiting violence against non-combatants, so that's uh, women, children and clerics. And he was responsible for getting quite a large number of kings and bishops throughout Ireland and Northern Britain to act as guarantors for this law. Um, he was a friend of King Alfred of Northumbria and he was obviously quite influential um, because we know that in 686 he returned 60 Irish captives who were being held in Northumbria back to Ireland. So he obviously had quite a lot of clout. Um, he does actually describe King Alfred as his friend, um, so, so that's not, that's not a, an over-exaggeration there. He possibly, and I'll talk about this a bit later, authored a poem that survives uh, called O Helper of Workers. But uh, most importantly, for our purposes, he was the author of The Life of St. Columba. Now, this Life of St. Columba that I've been talking about is a collection of stories written to demonstrate the sanctity of Columba. This was at a time before there was any formal canonization process. So for your found, the founder of your church or your monastery to be recognized as a saint, essentially what had to happen was by general acclaim, everyone had to just accept that you were, you were a saint. And so uh, you get lots of these kinds of works called hagiography, uh, which attempt to do just that, essentially demonstrate to everybody that your founder or the person that's the subject of your work was very much a saint. Now, it was written, we think, in the 690s, and we know that it made use of at least one earlier written source, although probably others. Um, that's Cumin of the Whites book. And the only reason we know that he made use of Cumin of the Whites book, in fact, the only reason we know that Cumin of the Whites book existed, is that there is one uh, account, there's one uh, story in the life of St. Columba where in the manuscript it stops, so the text stops, and then in a different hand the scribe has written essentially Adamman stops here but Cumin of the White continues and he gives us an extra chapter. Uh, so that's uh, why we know that there was an earlier work that at least in some of the anecdotes Adamman made use of. So now on to the beasts, which I'm sure is the reason that everybody has come here. Well, there are many references to animals in the text, and uh, from quite mundane ones to fairly exotic ones. Um, we have bulls, we have birds, we have whales, and uh, boars of marvellous size as well. Uh, but there's really two that I think you can argue could be seen as entirely mythical creatures, or creatures that's fairly hard to point to something that we know of as, as an animal. And those are the water beast in the River Ness and the deadly loathsome little creatures in the Northern Ocean. So uh, we'll turn to each of these uh, in turn now, starting with the water beast of the River Ness. So this is what Ab the Brun said happened. Once on one occasion, when the blessed man stayed for some days in the land of the Picts, he had to cross the River Ness. When he reached its bank, he saw some of the local people burying a poor fellow. They said they had seen a water beast snatch him and maul him savagely as he was swimming not long before. Although some men had put out in a little boat to rescue him, they were too late, but reaching out with hooks, they had hauled in his wretched corpse. The blessed man, having been told all of this, astonished them by sending one of his companions to swim across to the, weather, the river and sail back to him in a dinghy that was in the further bank. At the command of the holy and praiseworthy man, Lugian woke him in, obeyed without hesitation. He took off his clothes except for a tunic and dived into the water. But the beast was lying low on the riverbed. Its appetite, not so much sated as whetted for prey, it could sense that the water above was stirred by the swimmer, and suddenly swam up to the surface, rushing open-mouthed with a great roar towards the man as he was swimming midstream. All the bystanders, both the heathen and the brethren, froze in terror, but the blessed man, looking on, raised his holy hand and made the sign of the cross in the air, and invoking the name of, the God, of God, he commanded the fierce beast, saying, Go no further, do not touch the man, go back at once. At the sound of the saint's voice, the beast fled in terror, so fast one might have thought it was pulled back with ropes, but it had got so close to Ludney swimming that there was no more than the length of a pole between man and beast. The brethren were amazed to see that the beast had gone, and that their fellow soldier Lugni returned to them untouched and safe in the dinghy. And they glorified God and the blessed man, 
Even the heathen natives who were present at the time were so moved by the greatness of the miracle they had witnessed that they too magnified the God of the Christians. So pretty dramatic stuff here. Um, it's certainly uh, not the kind of happy, friendly Nessie that you often get today. Um, and uh, worth remembering as well, this is the River Ness, not actually Loch Ness. That said, this is often said in modern times to be the first reference to Nessie. Um, so just a, a potted selection of uh, things uh, that I've found in, in various books and articles. Um, Colin and Damon Wilson's World Famous Strange Tales and Weird Mysteries. Um, when they're talking about a report in the Inverness Courier in 1933, say, this was not, strictly speaking, the first account of the monster to appear in print. This distinction belongs to a Life of St. Columba, dating to about 565. I've just put dating to about 565 in red to say, don't believe that. It doesn't. Um, it may have been set in 565. So uh, that's uh, World Famous Strange Tales and Weird Mysteries. Um, another example there of this account being used as the first reference to an essay. Uh, Gareth Williams, A Monstrous Commotion. He is talking about Professor Roy McCall of the University of Chicago in his um, assessment of the various monster accounts, which he did in 1976, and says that Professor McCall ruthlessly hacked back the 3,000 documented sightings to just 269 valid reports of the monster. Of these, observation number one, carried the date, again, 565, really not sure why, but all of these people seem to have hinged on it. Um, time uncertain, and listed the observers as St. Columba, Lugni Mokumin, and others. So, again, this is this account being pointed to as the first reference to Nessie. Um, the third example, which is my absolute favourite, um, comes from a journal I'm sure you know well, uh, Limnology and Oceanography, and it's uh, a report by R.W. Sheldon and S.R. Kerr of the Fisheries Research Board of Ca Canada, and um, it's on the population density of monsters in Loch Ness, which this is, I have to say, my absolute favourite paper ever to come from an oceanography <laughs> journal. I mean, maybe the only paper I've ever read from an oceanography journal, but if it's, if it's only one, then uh, certainly it's well worth reading. Um, and here is how they start off their article. It is well known that there are monsters in Loch Ness. Their most characteristic features are that they are rarely seen and never caught but there are records of sightings extending back many centuries. So there we go, you can't really argue with that. Uh, again, pointing, seeing that the sightings go back many centuries, pointing, it seems, to this, uh, this account with Columba. Now, just before we move on, just a, a bit of an aside, I did think that this clearly, this um, article written in September, or published in September 1972, demonstrated how valid the work of the Fisheries Research Board of Canada was. And so I did have a look and see what they were doing now, um, but I'm sorry to report that in January 1973, the Fisheries <laughs> Research Board of Canada, after 75 years of operation, was relieved of responsibility for its research facilities and became a purely advisory body. Um, I don't want to say it's a conspiracy, but um, <laughs> there we go. Anyway, um, so the modern Loch Ness Monster was first sighted, apparently, in 1933, or certainly that's the first time there was a, an overt reference to it in the media, in the Inverness Courier. Courier. Um, since then, there's been many claimed sightings. Before then, there's really not very much. Um, there's possibly a sighting of something unknown, at least a sighting of an unknown animal, reported in the Northern Chronicle in 1930. Um, and various people have, since 1933, claimed that they saw something earlier. Um, most interestingly, there was a letter, I think it was to the Inverness Courier, by a man who said that he'd seen in an old manuscript a reference to the last dragon having been slain in Scotland in 1520, unlike the recently seen Loch Ness beast. Um, unfortunately, nobody seems to be able to point to where this manuscript is. I would love to know if anyone actually knows about it. <laughs> But, it seems that the modern monster first makes an appearance in the 1930s, and really it is only the Loch uh, Columbus beast that comes before that, that we can point to and say, yes, this was in a source before. Now, that said, does that mean that this is Nessie, or is it something entirely different? Well, um, Charles Thomas has suggested that 
it may well be a genuine tradition that Adamran has recorded. Remember, Adamran is writing about 100 years, slightly more probably after this event. He points to the fact that this man, who's um, one of Columba's monks, who's the one who's ordered to swim across the river, is Lugni Mokumun, who we know from elsewhere in Adamran's text, was a genuine individual. Because you can see he very much points to the fact that he was later as an old man, he was a prior of a monastery on the Isle of Ellen. So that's very much saying, look, this was him. You've heard of him. He was the old prior in this island. Um, we don't actually know, incidentally, Ellen is one of these other monasteries that we don't know exactly where it is, probably in the Inner Hebrides. Um, so Charles Thomas suggests that this tale came to Adrian through probably not more than one intermediary. And he goes further. He says, that we can take a good stab at what was really seen that day. So, according to Charles Thomas, this is what the monster was. <laughs> None other than a walrus. Now, um, again, uh, the plausibility of this has been notched up another notch by a, by a recent visitor to Orkney two weeks ago. Um, so that's, that's two walruses in five years. So, it's not a ridiculous stretch to say that a walrus could have made it to the River Ness uh, in Columbus Day. Um, does that necessarily explain the monster? Um, Charles Thomas thinks it does. I personally am not convinced, um, uh, some, some other people aren't either. Um, Jacqueline Borsch, oh that's done interesting things to the screen, anyway. Jacqueline Borsch um, has pointed to the presence of another beast which appears in the text. I've briefly mentioned it before. In another miracle story, there is a boar of marvellous size. Now, it seems to be, I would argue, quite plausible that if Adamin was capable of describing something in terms of something else people would know, that a seal of marvellous size or something similar could quite easily describe a walrus. I mean, one of the most notable things about the monster in the River Ness is it is exceptionally vague. It just tells you it's a beast, it doesn't say anything else really, it's a voracious, terrifying beast. No description is given. Um, so, arguably, it might not necessarily be a walrus, although who knows, maybe it was. Okay, uh, what about any other possibilities? Well, I don't want to um, pour scorn on, on anything or the validity of any of these these accounts, but there, it has been argued that it might be based on something that Adamant actually read. And Jacqueline Borsch, again, has pointed to an anecdote in Sulpicius Severus's Dialogi, which was written about 404, about St. Martin of Tours, and we know that Adamant had access to it in Iona's library. So this is an account that we know Adamant had. A serpent swimming in the river was cutting his way towards the bank where he had stopped. In God's name, said Martin, I order you to go back. At this word from the saint, the evil beast that once reversed its course, and under our very eyes, swam across to the further bank. As we all perceived that this had not happened without a miracle, he groaned deeply and exclaimed, Serpents hear me, but men will not hear. So, quite similar. I mean, not, not identical, but certainly you can see why if Adamran wanted to um, embellish or uh, create from scratch an account, that is perhaps a nice uh, and fairly good candidate for a source for this kind of idea. Um, there's other clues as well that might suggest that maybe Adamson had at the very least a very heavy hand in the shaping of this text. Uh, one of them is the phrase that he uses for this term here, in the province of the Picts. So um, you'll remember from that map there that Iona on the west coast stood really opposite a lot of Pictish territory, and quite a lot of the accounts in the life of St. Columba involve Columba travelling to the territory of the Picts. Now, when this happens, when this is described in the life of St. Columba, the territory of the Picts is described in one of two ways. So, as with here, Adrian uses the phrase in Pictorum Provincia, so in the Pictish provinces. Um, now, about half of the miracles set amongst the Picts use this terminology, and these are very much the large-scale Old Testament-style conversion miracles. So, you have 
battles with water beasts. You have um, nasty um, people who have taunted and mocked Columbus struck dead. You have Columbus raising people from the dead. The dead. They're generally very, very impressive miracles, and they always result in large swathes of pagan pits being converted to Christianity. There are another set of miracles that will occur amongst the Picts, but those use entirely different terminology. So, um, transdorsum Britannia, across the spine of Britain. So, it uses this term to mean essentially across the Grampian Mountains. We're not quite sure exactly where the spine of Britain is, but it seems to be used as a reference to crossing the Grampians. Um, as James Fraser, who first uh, categorised these miracles in these two settings, um, pointed out, these are much, much more mundane. They involve Columbus' foreknowledge of events. There are no so-called dumb-witted or sense-clouded Pictish heathens, and uh, there's no evil druids or anything like that. They're much, much more mundane. There are things like Columba and his men put their boat in a shed, and then Columba thought, ah, that shed might burn down, so they moved the boat, and lo and behold, that night the shed burned down. It's things like that. They're very, they're very much a smaller scale miracles, and the suggestion of James Fraser is that these are more likely, perhaps, to go back to eyewitness testimony, and maybe go back a bit further. Now, he suggests that this first group, so this in the Pictish provinces group, where the water beast account um, comes from, was written by Adabrin himself, possibly making use of a Pictish source. So again, another point in favour of saying, well, maybe it was Adabrin that puts this account of Columba and the Water Beast together. There's one more clue, and I think this is a, a very uh, tentative clue, but I think it's worth pointing out here, is this word that Adabrin uses to describe, well, what's in this translation translated as a poor fellow, um, homuncula, literally really little man. Um, it can be translated as poor fellow, wretched man, various other, uh, other ways of doing it, but at its core it just means little man. And Gilbert Marcus made some interesting observations about Adabrin's use of this word. This word. Um, in the Kitdog Library of Latin Texts, which is quite a large compendium of different uh, medieval Latin works, he searched for the word and came up with 12 occurrences between 501 and 735. Five of them were in Adamin's work, De Locus Sanctus. On top of that, um, there's three further uses, this one included, in Adamin's Life of St. Columba, which wasn't included in that first search, and there's one further use in that um, poem, Adiator Labyrinthian, which again has been argued to be written by Adamin. So Adamin seems to use this word quite a lot, uh, but why? And the clue, according to Gilbert Marcus, is the fact that it's in the word itself. Now, possibly in Adamin's own name. So Adamin ends in uh, what we'd call a diminutive suffix, so an or nan, which is really, it turns a name into a pet form of a name. It's probably like um, e in, uh, in English, so you can have like Robbie or Becky or anything like that. There's various other kind of names that kind of make it almost, like, yeah, make a, well, make a pet form of a longer name. Um, in Irish, Anne served as that, so it's quite common. You have names like Ivan, Beckon, Coleman, Dallin, Ernan. And for the <coughs> early medieval um, people, they thought that Adam, Adamin was a diminutive or pet form of Adam. Now, a lot of modern linguists don't agree with that necessarily, but we do know that that's what in the early Middle Ages in Ireland people thought Adamnan was, because we've got a text that said so. Uh, there's a text called Cormac's Glossary, written in the 10th century, and it begins, it's essentially a dictionary of different words, it tells you the meaning of different words in the Irish language, and it also tries to tell you the etymologies of some of them as well. It begins with the name Adam, and 
The most important thing here is the fact that Adam, that is homo, a man. So one of the definitions of Adam is a man. The second entry in Cormac's glossary, Adam now, that is homunculus, a little man. So essentially, to Adam now, homunculus could have been a Latin version of his own name. And uh, Gilbert Marcus actually appears oh, before God, just so you can get a sense, that's um, A D A. M N A N Adamna in the text. One dot rather than IE, they just do I and then homunculus, just to give you an idea of what it actually looks like there. Um, Gilbert Marcus suggests that Adamnan might have actually used homunculus sometimes almost as a bit of a signature. Um, there's certainly a lot of scholars did like to play games with words sometimes. Um, and he points out that in this word, uh, this poem, Adiator Labyrinthian. We've got this line here. Um, incidentally, this poem is one that each letter begins with a different letter, each line begins with a different letter of the alphabet. But towards the second half here, we have the I beg that me a little man. It's like, so I beg that me homunculum. And Gilbert Marcus suggests that maybe that's a bit of a signature, um, rather than using his own name. So it may or may not, it's a bit of a tangent to go, go to, but possibly adds to the, the uh, evidence that maybe this account of Columba and the Water Beast was written by Adam himself. So, to conclude, this half at least, uh, the work of Sapacius Severus is known to have been available to Adam and provides a potential source for the anecdote. And there are little hints that um, it could, aside from that, that it could well be Adamman's influence. However, others, particularly Charles Thomas, are not entirely convinced, and there is, I suppose, still the possibility that maybe it does go back to an eyewitness statement, although I would say very much the arguments, although not conclusive, tend to fall, I think, in favour of the fact that this particular account was written, or at least very, very heavily shaped by Adamman himself. So, what about the deadly, loathsome little creatures then? Dramatic pause. <laughs> well, these beasts appear in the third of three voyages of Cormac, Eolathan, which appear in Adrian's life of St. Columba. Now, Cormac, as described by Adrian, is a truly holy man who no fewer than three times laboured on the ocean in search of a place of retreat. Ne yet, ne yet, fun yet found none. I'll get that off my tongue there. Now, that is the, the first description in Irish literature of what was to become quite a common trope in the literary literature of Ireland. And that's the idea that you would set out from Ireland into the ocean to look for a place of retreat and hermitage. Now, a lot of... Um, Throughout the Middle Ages, but particularly in early medieval Ireland, there was a fascination with the early desert fathers in the early days of Christianity who went out into the desert for a place of solitary repentance. Now, deserts are not necessarily easy to come by if you live in Ireland or Scotland. So the next best thing is you go out and you find a deserted island somewhere and uh, live a life of prayer there. So, um, there's a whole genre of voyage tales um, that came out through medieval Ireland that um, involved just that, people setting out, visiting lots of different islands and having different adventures out in the ocean in different, in different ways. Um, I think the best way thing to compare it to is if you can think the Voyage of the Dawn Trader has got a fairly uh, good argument for actually being a modern day Irish voyage tale because uh, it's got very much the same kind of themes and very much the same kind of feel to it as a lot of these older older texts. But uh, Adamnan's accounts of Cormac actually are the earliest that we have of these kind of tales. So we're interested here in Cormac's third voyage, and uh, here it is. When this Cormac was travelling on the ocean for the third time, he found himself in such a danger that he came close to death. His ship had been driven with full sails by a steady wind from the south for fourteen summer days and nights, so that a straight course brought them to an area under the most northerly skies. 
They reckoned that they had passed beyond the range of human exploration and had reached a place from which they might not be able to return. There it happened, after the tenth hour of the fourteenth day, that a source of terror appeared, rising up on all sides, most fearsome, almost unendurable. To that day, assuredly, no one had ever seen such a thing. The whole sea was covered with deadly, loathsome little creatures. They struck with horrible force against the keel, against the sides of the boat, against the stern and the prow, and the pressure of them was so great that it was thought they would pierce the skin covering of the boat. These creatures, as those who were present afterwards described, were about the size of frogs, but exceedingly troublesome because they had, and this can be translated as either spines or stings, though they did not fly, but merely swam. They were also a great nuisance to the blades of the oars. Nor were these the only prodigies that Cormac and his fellow, fellow sailors saw, though this is not time, there is not time here to describe them. So again, quite dramatic stuff, um, fairly perilous, um, and you'll be pleased to learn that Cormac and his boat is blown to safety through the intercessionary prayers of Columba, who is of course many, many miles away. But um, the boat is blown back south again and away from danger. So, these creatures, as I've said, appear in the third of three voyages of Cormac. And each of them, actually, in each of them, Cormac travels steadily further. So the first of them, he sails an indeterminate distance, but not too far, from Eris and Mayo in the west of Ireland. In the second one, he ends up in Orkney. In the third one, he travels to the far northern ocean. So there seems to be kind of a boundary being pushed each, each time. Now, we know that in the form that Adamman gives us, these were, well, sorry, we know that these tales were not composed in their final form by Adamman. He must have got them from an earlier work. And um, that's because he numbers them. Well, in Voyage 1, Columbus says, today again Cormac has set sail, whereas Voyage 2 and 3 are said by Adamman to be Cormac's second and third voyages respectively. So it does seem that there were more than three voyages originally. It does seem that Adamman has maybe taken them from an earlier collection. So it's fairly, I would say, fairly, fairly evident that, that Adamman did not compose these. And actually, the second of these voyages, where he lands in Orkney, is one of these anecdotes where, in part of it, Columba travels to the Picts, and the terminology that's used is across the spine of Britain, Transdorsum Britanniae. So these voyages seem to themselves belong to this Transdorsum Britanniae collection of miracles, which are the ones that are a bit more mundane, a little bit less extravagant, um, which have been argued to be more likely to derive from an eyewitness account. Now, James Fraser argued that these Transdorsum Britanniae miracles are likely to be taken from Cumin of the White's book that we know was a source by Adamant, which seems to which was written in the 630s, probably more likely the 640s. However, it's I would say fairly likely that they were actually came into their final form a bit later than that, probably the 680s or 90s. This is shameless plug time because I'll talk a bit more about why I think this um, at the Saint Magnus uh, Saint Magnus conference next month. Uh, but in a nutshell, I think that. The way that they discuss Orkney fits better with the political and ecclesiastical context of the 680s and 90s than it does with the 640s. That said, it seems that we can possibly suggest that this story has come down to Adamran through three different texts that we are two different texts that we can point out. There may well have first been a voyage of Cormac collection which then was taken up into this collection of miracles that we can call the Trans Dorsum Britannia miracles, these, these fairly mundane miracles set amongst the Picts, which then ended up in Adrian's Life of St. Columba. Of course, it is very much possible that this Trans Dorsum collection might have been where the Cormac miracles first came together. We, we don't know, but that's one possible route. We know that they were in at least one other earlier work than Adrian's. Um, there does seem to be reasonably good reasons to suggest that this account might ultimately derive from an eyewitness account. It's got a more detailed description of the beasts 
if you remember the beasts of the river Ness, very much were, it, it was vague, it was monstrous, it was terrifying, but if you were asked to describe it based on that uh, description alone, you really couldn't, other than it was big and scary. Uh, whereas these, as we've seen, they've, they've, it's quite detailed. It's, it's very much an attempt to try and describe something in terms that, that his readers would understand and trying to convey uh, the sense of, of what these things were like. Also, uh, this ties in with the idea that these, these transdors in Britannia and America will seem a lot more mundane. Um, you might say, kind of more believable that they, they might actually derive from an eye, eyewitness account, is the way that it is resolved. So if you remember, the water beast of the River Ness was suddenly, through the intercession of Columba, pulled back as if by ropes. So quite dramatic. Whereas here, the wind changes and they're taken away from these little loathsome creatures. The loathsome creatures don't change their behaviour in any way. All that happens is the wind changes because Columba has, has prayed for it. Um, so again, I would say it's feasible or very feasible that these do perhaps derive from some kind of eyewitness account. Which leads us to the question, what do they? If they, if they do derive from an eyewitness account, here's a few suggestions. Now um, you may have others. Um, let's just first of all look at the description from Alvin again. Uh, these creatures, as those who were present afterwards described, were about the size of frogs, but exceedingly troublesome because they had, and this is either spines or stings, uh, actually there is the, the original word, though they did not fly but merely swam. They were also a great nuisance to the blades of the oars. Um, that great nuisance could also be translated as caused damage to the blades of the oars as well, so that's another very intriguing there. So, what has been suggested? One suggestion that's been made is a uh, jellyfish. Well, um, certainly, a big shoal of jellyfish arguably could have an ability to restrict oars. Uh, they do, of course, have stings. Arguably, they could well be too large for the description there. And also, it is very unlikely, I would say, that a Irish sailor would have not known what a jellyfish was. I mean, it's, they're fairly common to find washed up on the, on the shore. So that is one possibility that's been suggested. Um, another possibility is squid, arguably. Um, it's been suggested that maybe the beaks of squid could have been perceived as stings. Um, again, you could argue that maybe the size isn't right and maybe they would have been familiar to, to sailors, but again, it is a possibility. Uh, another one, actually from my dad, this one, um, the first time I, I told him about this he was like, it's eels. And I, I think it's got quite a lot of going to them. Um, the elvers, the, the small young eels, do migrate quite often in, in big shoals. Um, and they can climb up surfaces as well, so you can see how potentially like the, uh, they could uh, scare people in a boat. Uh, spines is maybe the sticking point there. I mean, you can see the spines on them, but they're only when they're very, very young. So perhaps, perhaps not. But I, I do think it's a, it's a plausible one anyway. Now, the final candidate, um, which I have to say I'm not entirely convinced by, has been uh, suggested by David Woods, who suggests that these creatures, the size of small fo small uh, frogs with uh, stings, are none other than the dolphin. Now, he's written a paper on this, and um, I have to say I'm not convinced, but his argument is that Adamnan may have misread a beautiful Latin word there, ratiariarium, ratiariarium, small boats, as ranarum, frogs, and that something the size of a dolphin is much more likely to have damaged the oars of a boat than anything small. Now, as I've said earlier there, this word here, infesto, which appears in um, Alvarin's text here, has been translated to mean they were a great nuisance to the oars, as well as they damaged the oars. So it, that's, I would say that's not necessarily um, a given that that's what that means. And he also argues that dolphins' snouts look like stings, and so would have terrified the sailors in that way. Again, I would suggest that a 
hardened Irish seafarers would probably know what a dolphin looked like. Um, and probably wouldn't have thought they looked at, or probably wouldn't have got these things mixed up. But there you go, that's uh, one possible candidate that's been argued. I would say nothing necessarily clinches it absolutely, although some may be more, more than others. So, to bring everything to a close, really, I would summarise that as far as the water beast of the River Ness goes, although it's possible it goes back to an eyewitness account, I think it's more likely that the story in its form that we have has been at least heavily shaped by Adam, if not probably written by him probably using uh, inspiration from material that he had in his own library at Iona. In contrast, it seems more likely from the more vivid um, descriptions that are given that the deadly, loathsome little creatures are ultima ultimately derived from an eyewitness account, although their true identity remains uncertain. And just finish off, I thought I'd have, couldn't finish without a nice picture of the Pictish beast which appears in lots of uh, symbol stones throughout Northern Britain. Um, potentially to fuel consideration of uh, what might have been seen on these occasions. So uh, that is that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lucian. That was fascinating. I'm thinking sea urchins. Sea urchins? Oh. Um, any questions for Ocean? Oh. Yes. Um, are, are the words um, for um, squid and um, you know all those other likely things? Do they exist? Do we know how far back those words go? The Even words? Other for, texts? To be honest, I don't know. I have to admit, I don't because know. Because you say thought. the sailors would know them, are there any records or accounts? Well, it would be more, it would be more that they would have a lot of these things I think they would have seen rather than necessarily yes. they would have, have known the words for. But yes, but maybe they certain. called squids and stuff loads of little creatures. Oh, they could. They will, they will. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did they have a word for squid or whatever? I have to say, I don't know off the top of my head. I'm, I'm sure they will have. You, I think good candidates would be works like Isidore of Seville's um, On the Nature of Things, talks about lots of different animals and, and things like that. And that's that's a work that Adam and, and Iona would have had. I would have to go away and, and have a look to see. Um, I would say almost certainly they will have, but to be quite honest, I, I don't know if, they, if there's a specific word for squint in uh, 7th century Latin or not. Well, I've got a question. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, you mentioned the Irish Sea Yes. I was very interested in what you had to say about the, the fact that you thought Adonis might have taken the story from something about St. Martin of Tours. Yes. Uh -huh. Because I was thinking, well, you know how Columbus often portrayed using heroic language? Yes. Because it was high war and a yeah, leader yeah. and all sorts of things, and of course Martin Luther was a soldier, was he not? Mm. And I just wondered if you think I've got the right mark. <coughs> yeah, but, yeah. And of course Martin. Yeah, because he travelled through yes, Europe, and yeah. yeah. And St Martin's also quite a significance in the, in the Western Seaport as well. Mm, yeah. It, you could make a good case for London having picked that to just bolster, you know, political thing to bolster Columbus. Very much so. I mean, he was, he was the he was the ideal saint really at the time. I mean, he's one of the few saints who his his hagiography gets written actually before he dies in some cases. I mean, he's he's uh, absolutely, and it was well known as well. So if people could point, if people could point to that and say, ah, Saint Martin did that, Columba must be significant because he did. Then yeah, very much so. I, I think it it may then, as you say, be. Kind of averse, maybe as readers would have expected that, and and pointed to it and said, yes, yes, I've seen something similar. Because the modern reader might miss that because St Martin's maybe not the first. No, no, absolutely, absolutely not. No. Back then. Back then, he very much would, he very much would have been, and it would have been something that would have been in the library of a lot of the great monasteries anyway. So, yes, that's a, a very, very interesting point. That these things that we might miss might have been deliberately avert, although. To the reader, that might not necessarily have instantly made them think, "Oh, this is where he got the story from." It might have been much more a, "Ah, Columba was yeah. as much of a miracle worker as this great yeah. saint." Like so, yeah, yeah absolutely, uh -huh. absolutely. This behavior, this leading. Yes, yes. From the front, mm. as it were. Yeah. Oh, so mm. Any other questions? Uh, we'll the questions. That seems to be a, yes. a, a sort of bizarre fascination of medieval times with unusual and strange creatures. I mean, so we have the map of Mundi, of course, the yeah. sort of monopods and the dog heads and all oh, yeah, of I know. bizarre things and, and stories. And I, I was wondering, what, you know, is, is that just perhaps just putting together and, and making up some nice fables and things like that as opposed to anything being based in 
fact at all, or do you think with it? It's really hard to guess some of these. I mean, dog heads yeah. are fascinating. Yeah. Like I think Saint Christopher even becomes a, a dog head, yeah. which is bizarre. Yeah. Like, it, and, and you do think that people believe that? Surely yeah. not. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it, it is. It is very odd. I mean, you certainly have the idea that there are strange, monstrous things at the fringes of the known world, mm -hmm. and you can see that coming through here. And. Um, the British Isles, in particular, occupies a special place in in that kind of discourse, in a way, um, because I mean, writers from Iona embraced the notion that they were at the edge of the inhabited world, because that meant that Christ's message had been taken to the ends of the earth, and beyond that, you have monstrous places and, and a bit of a void. I mean, they certainly, I mean, they knew that the the earth was a globe, but it seems that their, their, their vision was that there were the three inhabited continents probably sitting kind of north of the Tropic of Cancer, south of the Arctic Circle, kind of in that kind of top third of the, the globe in a kind of almost yet yeah, Mapa Mundi style circle. Avonin incidentally is the first person that puts Jerusalem in the centre of the inhabited world that Mapa Mundi draws from. Um, but you very much have this idea that Jerusalem is the centre, literally, and on the fringes. There are monstrous things. Orkney actually inhabits that as well. Orkney is, in a lot of, I think from classical sources onwards, it becomes the last inhabited place, which potentially gives some significance to these three anecdotes that uh, Adam gives there, because you've got a voyage just a little bit out from Ireland, and you've got a voyage to the most northerly inhabited place, at, at least in literature, and then you have a voyage beyond, um, which is to where these monstrous beasts live in. So, I would say there certainly was the notion that there were scary things, and certainly Adabnan, I think, is engaging with that, but I think he's doing so in a way that very much, that despite them being scary and unknown, they are still physical, tangible things that are real. And I, I mean, I think that's, that's something that he is engaging with all throughout Cormac's stories, because um, with Orkney as well, if it's if it's the case that he's using Orkney as a as a point to make a point, because he goes to the edge of human exploration, Orkney to Adamin was a place that he knew about where there was current contemporary political affairs going on, and so he's kind of engaging with these two things. He knows the literary implications of it, but he also knows that it's a real it's a real place that you, that you can go to, and I, I think that's what's going on with these because. I think it does, it's not vague and kind of monstrous or, or demonic even, and there's not, they don't seem to have any special powers or anything like demons, for example, that, that appear in some, some other parts of his work. Um, it's just very much, they're there, they're a nuisance to the oars, they think they might burst the skins, they don't, they go away. Yeah. But, the, but there is this feeling of, of the edge and it's all, it's all a bit scary. Uh, but yes, it, it's, it is fascinating to think, did, did they actually believe all of this yeah, stuff? Yeah. These, these things that yeah. inhabited far off places. Yeah. Yeah. yeah? I'm just wondering, do you have any idea if those people who reported seeing the monster in the Loch Ness in 1933, would they have known the life of St. Columba? Was there any English translation available at the time? Uh, there will have been, uh, but whether they read it or not, I'm not sure. Um, but the important thing is that doesn't say it was in Loch Ness, it says it was in the River Ness. But yes, I suppose it could potentially have been. I think it would have been something that would have been, okay, not common knowledge, but the kind of knowledge that you would have had. People would have known about these stories, about, about things happening. But um, I'm not sure whether that was directly responsible for Nessie. Um, I don't want to say that other than invented the not Loch Ness monster, but um, I'm sure I'm sure whatever they saw was was very monstrous and, and different. But uh, I don't know. Um, I don't know if uh, there's any record of them being inspired by it or not. I actually don't know when the first dots were joined. Um, I don't know when it was first pointed out after that event that Adamman had encountered. Uh, sorry, Adamman wrote about this. Um, but yes, it's an interesting question. There's probably some kind oh, of folk memory thing 
Yeah. Or some story that was Loch Ness is a vast body. Oh, of absolutely, and the what? Yeah. And you know, that kind of the feed of the water. Yeah. So the, 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 the way that you get other um, loch monsters. Yeah. And, like and there's and there's kelpies as well. Kelpies. I think there was kelpies yeah, there, and exactly and that's the thing. So I mean, there's yeah. certainly there's certainly will have been folk tales about things in the water. So presumably when they saw something, in, or whatever, in 1933, in the fact that yeah. people that saw it were owned a hotel that's now here and there. Yeah. Um, um. <laughs> and, um, you know, they could have looked back then for something yeah. somewhere. Yeah, you know, absolutely. To kind of back it up and, and do something. And I, I would love to see this sound. This is something I've, I feel I, I need to possibly make a personal project to track down this uh, so-called book behind this letter. This man saying that there was an old text that says, um, Talks about the last dragon being killed, unlike the recently seen Loch Ness beast. Um, but yeah, it is fascinating. But of course, there's, yeah, there's things attached and folklore to all sorts of bodies of water. So yeah, it's difficult to say what exactly they were tapping into there when they saw it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, did you? The 1933 sighting was um, heralded because it was seen by a surgeon and therefore a professional person mm -hmm. who um, you could take his word for it. Um, there had been various other sources, but nobody believed anything that anybody said. It was just because of his professionalism mm. that obviously he couldn't tell a lie. Except <laughs> now we know that that certain faked it. Faked it. <laughs> but, <laughs> or at least that's what he said many decades later. But, uh, that's, but uh, yeah, have no fear, there are plenty of other unexplained oh, things yes. in the water. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yes. And, as I've said, this, this is not the fact that um, Columba may not have seen a water beast in River Ness is not in any way intended to discredit the notion that there are plenty of water beasts, as this map demonstrates. <laughs> it's nothing else. <laughs> I mean, look at that. That is a little bit scary. Uh, out of interest, is anyone convinced by the walrus? Yeah, I'm not really. Do you, do you like it the, as an explanation? It's probably because it's, it's happened so, so yeah. recently that you just think, well, yeah, you know. Yeah, I, mean, <laughs> I, suppose it, I mean, I suppose it looks a bit strange and toothy, but... Uh, and large. And large. I mean, I would think that with the description, it probably, I mean, it'd still have to go under a lot of embellishment to become something it's that it's mauled always, and killed somebody. But, always yeah. get enhanced with the telling, don't they? You know, mm. it's going to be scarier the more yes. you tell. Mm -hmm. It's just the one thing about the walls is they're not very nippy. No, no. You know, so there'll be lumbering involved. Yeah, I don't you think, think somebody will be able to swim away from it. I don't know, maybe they're incredibly fast in the water. No, I don't. Yes, it's... Uh, I, I mean, I can see where he's coming from it, with it, but I, I just, I don't think it, it works as a description where you have Things like the Sopakis Severus's Life of St. Martin, which has dramatic attacks by serpents in the water, mm -hmm. and then you have what well, potential eyewitness account of a walrus. I I'm not sure it, it really stands up, mm -hmm. but. Uh, they would have known what a walrus was. Yeah. Because like, you know, walrus ivory and things like that. They would have... Well, that's a good question. I don't. Any archaeologists here? Was there pre-Norse walrus ivory in British Isles? Early Norse stuff. I mean, that's not coming up for vacuum, I suppose. Interesting. Yeah. That's a very good question, eh? But then they thought it was one of the narwhals of unicorns, so you could see the tusks on the walrus. Yeah, yeah, of course. To know to know what it was, but yeah, I just think I just think there would be enough things they could compare a walrus to that they could they could describe it. Well, unless a lot of it is submerged by water, in which case you just see the head. The head, and that. Yeah, I can see that could be pretty terrifying, <laughs> to be fair. Um, Do walruses attack humans? Sorry? Do walruses attack humans? I don't think they're known for it. I don't think they're known for it. I mean, yeah, I don't think. I mean, they didn't put out, like, in Radio Orkney warnings to the rest of the society. <laughs> Stay in your homes, don't come out. <laughs> Walrus on the loose. I mean, considering that it was kind of pecked at by a bird and it just got fed up and swam away. <laughs> I think that shows you more of the kind of attitude yeah, when the they're birds we should be watching it for. Yeah, it's yeah. a shame that I'm visiting the Jaws poster now with a big walrus. But <laughs> <laughs> any other questions for Ocean? Could have been a poet. Mm. 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 Mm.
very long travel to pull their breath on, potentially. Just a bear. Well, they might keep down as far as um, Iceland. <laughs> 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 it's been a hell of a winter. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, bears, I think they were pretty much they pretty much died out by that point, but that's this, not this, to say that there weren't this, some. This, this is kind of the cost, isn't it? But this thing. will be the third or fourth telling that gets recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it starts off with a bear, then it's a beast, then it's a monster. Mm. Yes. Yeah. It's, yeah, there's no. No. They're just a very big old bear. That's the tenth telling. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that's like after like it starts off with somebody's been stung by a wasp or something, and then <laughs> the, the way they were savagely mauled. And, yes. Yes. Right, folks, well, with no more questions for Ocean, I'd like to join me again in thanking for a really fascinating talk.